Faster C++ compile times are a new feature in 4.15. What that means is basically Epic has gone through and instead of having a giant engine header file that was included by pretty much everything or the Unreal Ed.h file, you're going to have unique headers for the files themselves and they're going to include basically what they use. Rather than including everything, it's just going to include what you can use. So as an example, on the left we have our header file for 4.14, and on the right we have it for 4.15. And you can see we have some differences by adding in a few more things. We grab directly some things like the green framework and some macros, and then anything that needs it has a new header called core minimal. And this basically includes some things that are pretty much required in most things, like f strings, names, arrays, vectors, basically the minimum requirements. Every CPP file also includes its matching H file first. So in this case, the first include is the camera actor.h for the camera actor.cpp. It basically lets them make sure that everything is validated. So everything that is needed is required and is there. Like I mentioned before, we don't have the monolithic header file anymore, such as the engine H or Unreal Ed H. Some things can still use it for compatibility sake, but you will get a warning if you try to include it from now on. Basically, they don't want that anymore, and it's going to make it better in the future. And then nothing in explicitly includes a pre-compiled header anymore. They're no longer force included. What this all means is basically you'll be able to set it up to only use what it needs, and it's going to reduce compile times by 25 to 50 percent. I will say from my personal experience, compiling a 4.15 engine from the GitHub, I get about 40 percent increase. It's really nice. So that's basically it. It's going to basically, for the most part, compiles are faster. That's basically what it comes down to. Things are now more compact, more self-inclusive. Things don't reference everything else anymore, and compile times are faster. Added in 4.15 is the Actor Sequence plugin, which allows us to add in the sequencer into Blueprint Actors. First thing you'll need to do is ensure it's enabled. So under Plugins, Edit Plugins, Editor, we'll find the Actor Sequence Editor Experimental. We'll go and enable it and it'll restart your project. Keep in mind this is experimental, not everything works right now. We'll just cover the basics on it as a new feature. Now, what happens once we do that is we will now have the new Actor plugin. So if we looked here, we find the Actor Sequence. And if we scroll down, we'll find Actor Sequence under Sequence. It adds in a new plugin actor, an Actor Sequence component, and allows us to change a few options. The same basic stuff as if we were doing any other type of animation or using a sequencer. We can change the play rate, looping, different times, things like that, what it's socketed to. But the key here is open in tab. By default, if you click on the sequencer, you can't actually see anything. And it's not really going to show up up here. We'll hit sequencer, but it'll be blank. We need to hit open in tab, and that will open the currently selected sequence in our editor. Keep in mind you can't have more than one of these enabled, so that's what you need to do to open this exact one. Once we open it, we'll find our normal sequencer. And for the most part, everything works like we expected. There's a few differences. Let me go ahead and hit play on this and we'll see what happens. In this case, this cube over here, which looks like it's hovering, is actually firing off a sequence to change its up and down Z vertical position. It allows us a really nice easy way to keyframe animate things or do things that we need using the sequencer rather than just having to use a timeline or lerps or anything like that. It's really nice and handy. Now a couple things to note. You'll notice here we have an event track with two events. One of these is my payload event with a payload, and the other one is just simply a normal event called payload. You'll notice they are here, and when I hit play, nothing's happening. If we go into my actual blueprint, we have a payload and a payload event, but neither of them are firing. Unlike the normal level sequences for sequencer, which are part of the level, and the events go in the level blueprint. Because this blueprint is part of a, sorry not, this plugin is part of a blueprint, you actually put those events 
inside of the blueprint that's calling it. So the blueprint that contains this plugin has those payload events. So in this case, I could hook up this first one and hit play. Now you'll see it says hello one. And I could also hook up the second one. This is using a payload. So of course I make sure the signature matches. We'll hit play and we'll see hello two and hello one. So keep that in mind. That's about the biggest difference I noticed was events are inside the blueprint locally rather than in the level blueprint. And that's it. That's an overview of our actor sequence plugin. It's pretty simple. It works rather nicely now. And it's a good easy way to get some nice animation built into our system using the sequencer editor. Added in 4.15 is the ability to modify the volume and the pitch of an audio track in sequencer. These are really simple. We have an audio track that plays. Now we have a new dropdown that gives us the volume and the pitch and allows us to easily keyframe them as needed. So for example, I could do a keyframe here, the volume of one, then I could have it slowly fade out to zero like that. And you can see our volume can be keyframed. Same thing with the pitch. And that's honestly pretty much what this is. They just added volume and pitch multiplier to audio and you can keyframe it inside of Sequencer. Content Hot Reloading is the ability for the built-in versioning system to automatically reload content when it has changed. It's going to automatically scan and detect changes and propagate them into your editor. Now, there's two requirements to make this work. First of all, you must be using one of the built-in source control setups get perforce subversion you have to be using one of the built-in ones in order for this to work properly it will not work properly if you're just using an external source control second of all you must turn it on in 4.15 under experimental as this is experimental we have content hot loading hot reloading under tools so if we go ahead and check this you'll find that basically it enables content hot reloading in the editor when syncing new assets via source control so what this means is if someone was to change some of these assets, it'll let me know in real time and it'll let me know that these things have changed and allow me to push the new changes directly into my uh, editor without needing to sync and all of those things like that. It'll keep them basically synchronized with everyone else using these projects. And it's useful for things like meshes, blueprints, and stuff like that. Now you do get one additional feature if you were to right click on anything that is under source control under asset actions you now have reload under the experimental section what that does is it reloads the asset off of your disk not off of the source but off of the disk so for example let's say some changes were made to this but they haven't been synced up you could right click asset actions reload it'll pull the version off your disk without the changes and it will go ahead and keep them so content hot reloading is useful if you have multiple people working on the project and it gives you a more real time approach to having things be synced up. In 4.15, the engine has been updated to support HDR or high dynamic range output displays, as well as the tone mapper has been changed for the film setting. Now I'll go ahead and show you what this means and some issues you may run into. For HDR, it's pretty simple. You can check and see if the display you're currently hooked up to supports HDR. This is generally done at runtime when the game is initially initialized. So basically if it supports it, it'll find out when it starts and it'll give you back a valid result. After that, you can enable HDR display output by simply targeting our game user settings, turn it on or off, and whatever nits you want the display to be running at. Now these are all things unique to HDR. One thing to note, if you are currently running the game on the non-HDR display, say the user has more than one monitor, and you enable HDR display output, the game will basically shift over to that display. Now our second big change is the default tone mapper, which apparently I spelled wrong here, was changed from a default of zero for tone mapper fill, film to a default of one. And that will mean some changes to your default look of your game, as well as things like your missive light output. Let me show you what I mean by that. 
Let's go ahead and let's adjust our tone mapper by doing r.tonemapper film 0 back to our default setting in 4.14. Now the first thing you might have noticed, let's open up, uh, let's make a, let's go to our VR display. The first thing you may notice is things are a little more washed out. That's because we're not using the more high dynamic range supported tone mapper. If I toggle this back and forth, I'll go 0 to 1, you'll notice things darken up a little bit with 1 and they lighten up a, a little bit with 0. So your game itself may immediately look different. That's something to note. You can turn it back to zero if you want. Maybe set it up as a console command when your game starts. Default your game to zero if that's your desired effect and not worry about the changes. Epic has noted that this may be removed later, so keep that in mind. You may not be able to always use this. Now one of our biggest changes is the way emissive works. Let me change this back to zero and let's go ahead and throw an emissive item into our scene. So let's grab a cube, we'll put it here, and let's throw our emissive material on it. And here is a emiss emissive material, which is set very high as you can see, because I want to get this nice little glowing effect. And it's glowing bright red, and you can see it reflecting everywhere. So we're getting the basics of what we'd expect when we're plugging a value simply into our emissive, using the older tone mapper. Now I'm going to change this to tone mapper 1, and you're going to see a slight difference. And by slight, I mean, you're gonna wonder what the heck just happened. And here's our difference. Tone Mapper 1, for the most part, pretty much removes the ability for emissive to look like it's emitting a solid color. Now, if we look at this, we have our red glow. If we toggle between zero and one, if you watch the glow on the outside, the actual effect, the heat effect, we're getting our red. However, our item itself is now glowing white or a whitish color. That's going to be your primary difference between 0 and 1 tone mapper film for your missive effect. So if I was to, for example, let's pull this over here and adjust it in real time, we'll drop this down to 0. We have, no, of course, no missive, no color. 1 gives us our standard value, but you'll notice, well, we now have our white instead of what we'd expect for red. And you'll notice I could, for example, not type it there, bring this back up, bring it back to 0, this was the effect we used to get and we expected. And as we adjusted it up, we saw it glow redder and redder and it continued on. This is what we got to basically emulate kind of like a glowing or emissive panel. With the new tone mapper again, it's no longer gonna be available. We're gonna get our more whiter effect. Once you start applying emissive, you're gonna start seeing the white come into play until we get something like that. So that's just something to note with tone mapper one, which is your default. You're going to end up getting something like this for emissive, which may not be your desired result. So feel free to change it running a console command r.tonemapperfilm, zero for disabled, or what we used to have in 4.14 and before, tone mapper film one for the new ACES standard for tone mappers, and we'll get the different emissive effect. 4.15 adds the ability to have a high-end mobile or metal preview inside of our viewport. Now by default, this is only going to show you which platforms are supported currently in your project settings. And by default, that's probably going to be your high-end mobile and your metal preview. Now note, this is different than the 4.15. 4.15 showed you mobile previews, default mobile, HDMI preview, Android preview, and iOS ES2 preview, but the high-end one allows us to do things such as Metal, Vulkan, and ES3.1. So for example, if I clicked on iOS Metal, my scene will recompile, and this is what it's going to look like on a Metal device. Now what I mean by the other options are, if they're enabled in your project settings, you will be able to view them in the options. Right now, for example, we have OpenGL ES3.1 on Android, if I enable that, and Vulkan I will now get the options to see what these would look like under ES3.1 and Vulkan. We go back to Settings, Preview, High and Mobile. We now see the GL, ES3.1, and Vulkan previews. So this is a nice way to preview what these things will look like on those platforms in the editor without having to build them out. Keep in mind, it's going to show you what it's using. And it's going to take a little while to recompile your shaders since it has to recompile everything for those platforms.